I just want to do sort of part two of what I talked about last week. So I was talking about my title was Jesus Played a New Tune out of Matthew 11. And they talked about, that, that was just a title for, whoops, for how much things change from the old to the new. And I traced all the developmental changes that happened through the Old Testament and how it seemed to be that shifts happened and, and new things came into being. So David stood up and said, oh, I got a revelation. You don't actually want sacrifices. Whereas there's books and books of the Old Testament written by Moses that describe how to make blood sacrifice, how to do it well and how to do it according to the law, and David suddenly realizes, he gets a revelation, ah, actually that's not really what you're after, God, you're after my heart. So in Psalm 40, he says that, and the the changes that happened with Noah, where before that, you know, God feels free and is free to drown the whole world because of sin, and then after Noah, he makes a covenant with Noah, and then he doesn't do that anymore, and he puts a rainbow in the sky. So all through the Old Testament, you've seen these developmental shifts, sometimes that are confusing. So in David's era, he had a whole bunch of people who their whole job, the Levites, was around how to kill animals for God. And then David says, well, actually, the revelation I've got now is what you do is you play and sing. And it's a different skill. So you've got the same guys and says, get your guitars out and put your knives away and just worship the Lord in his presence day and night and everything's going to be fine. And so it was a big shift. It was a big change in their thinking, a big change in their their behavior when that happened. And then when Jesus comes along, he initiates the biggest shift and the biggest set of changes in all of history. What Jesus did was, was so profound that I think often that we live on the wrong side of it. We still get affected and infected by Old Testament, Old Covenant thinking and we don't live in all the good and all the brilliant stuff that Jesus actually did because somehow either no one's told us or if they did it was so amazing we didn't believe it was true but actually he came so that we would know it was true he actually Jesus came as God in man physically present to show us that God is alive, to show us what the Father is like, and to do something that would change all of our lives forever. In fact, he didn't just change individual lives, he changed the destiny of the whole of creation in one incredible act on the cross and in resurrection. He shifted the power structures of the planet on that day. Life is not the same after the cross and the resurrection for anybody, not just believers. He initiated a whole new era for all of creation, all of the planets, all of this planet, all of the people on it from that time on and forevermore. It wasn't just a small thing that it's nice if you choose it or you don't. The cross and the resurrection affects you whether you believe it or not. And I want to just show you that, more about that this morning. See, Jesus initiated a new covenant, a new era, a new epoch, a new, a new season. And when Jesus was crucified, it says that the temple curtain was ripped in two from top to bottom. And it was a huge curtain, two inches thick. And it signified this thing, that up to that point... God had been in a temple, now he was out, and he was after you and me in love. That was a big change. God is out, and he's on the move in the whole planet, and he's after you in love. And Jesus, it's prophetically declared about Jesus that he would be the child that was born, the son that was given, this is in Isaiah 9, And it says this, for unto us a child is born, and we quote this every Christmas, and a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the increase of his government and peace, 
there'll be no end. And we could trip over that and maybe sing it in a Christmas carol and think, isn't it nice? Yea, the, Jesus is the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. And it doesn't land, it doesn't impact, it doesn't register what, what a, the import of this, the incredible thing that He's come to do and announce and to exercise. He's initiated, He's the Prince, He's the King of a kingdom. He's the, king, he's the king of a different way of running everything. And it's a, it's a government of peace of which there'll be no end. Now, when British people hear the word peace, they think calm. They think lack of inner turmoil. They think no guns, no violence. They think getting on with my neighbor. But the Hebrew word peace means that but that's only one small section of what this word means. This government of peace is not just about you having a nice, quiet insides. It's not just about you getting on well with your friends or with your, your partner. It's not just even just about you getting on well with God. It's not just about peace with God, although it is about peace with God. If you do a word study on this, and I, I, I'd encourage you to do this, you will find that the government that Jesus has come to spread at his resurrection is that of shalom, which means favor, health, prosperity, welfare, soundness, friendship, and relational harmony. Whoa. We don't have one word that means all of those things. So when you translate the Hebrew, you come up with the most approximate. So the increase of His government and favor, health, prosperity, welfare, soundness of mind and friendship, there will be no end. That's the era, that's, that's a, a, a high level view of the era that Jesus has bought and paid for, that He's initiated at His cross and resurrection, is an era where the increase of favor, the increase from God, the increase of health, prosperity, welfare, soundness of mind and friendship, there will be no end. Wow. And he's even called the, he's even called the Prince of Shalom. It's part of his nature. And you see that in his life. He distributes it provision. He distributed peace. He distributed health. He distributed e resurrection. He distributed this kingdom. He initiated this kingdom of shalom. And then he gave his disciples the same job. And he said to them, go and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, preach the kingdom of God is at hand, and take your peace with you. And where your peace should be ringing some bells, where shalom rests, where welfare, where health, where, where, where soundness rests, you've been received and the kingdom is coming. If not, take it back and move on. You are a walking atmosphere shifter if you're a Christian. You're a carrier of the shalom of heaven, the well-being, the soundness, the beauty, the health, the prosperity of heaven. We carry something of this heavenly kingdom into every place we go. Hello? This is, this is an awesome privilege. This is incredible. And we've so shrunk down the gospel that we're just like, well, you know, peace to you. I just pray that you have a peaceful night's sleep. No, we're administering something much more massive than that. Much more significant than that. Much more earth-shaking than that. The cross and resurrection ushered in something so profoundly different from anything that had gone before that the Old Covenant is talked of as being obsolete and replaced in the New Testament. This cross and resurrection ushered in a new era. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scripture bomb you for 10 minutes. Is that all right? You're going to have to go away and do the work. I'll give you some references, but I'm going to tell you what they mean. And if you really want to know some more, go, go read these references. This is Paul. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. Because I'm not sure, certainly in the early days, that the other apostles, Peter and, and so on, actually caught the import, the massiveness of what Jesus had done. They were so trapped inside their Judaism, which was rooted in all the Old Covenant Scriptures. 
That they struggled to see that it could go to the Gentiles. They struggled to get out of, well, what kind of food should we eat? They were still trapped in all these sort of legalistic things. And many Christians are still trapped in that now. If you think you have to work to earn God's favor or keep the rules, you are living in the old and the old is dead. If you're living thinking that Satan is big and he can eat you alive, you're living in the old and the old is dead. If you're living thinking you now have no power, you have no significance, and you aren't born to change this world, you're living in the old, and the old is dead. If you believe that you're small, and you, your job is to be ever so humble, and keep your nose clean until you get to heaven, you're living in an old covenant paradigm, and the old is dead. Because this, this, this cross and resurrection, Paul had a a heavenly experience, he says. He said he received this gospel through a working of God's power. And I'm just going to hit you with some of the things that he said. He said that the cross, that all sin was paid for and all punishment was exhausted. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood it's a big word but what it means is all all of the payment that needed to be paid for all of the sin that was ever done got paid by Jesus on the cross his suffering was sufficient to satisfy the 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 justice and the wrath of God completely and exhaustively on the cross that happened for all men, for all women, for all mankind, for all time. In one event, one sacrifice was sufficient for it all. For every sin you've ever done, are doing, or will ever do, as a free gift, you are justified because Jesus suffered. And the whole, that's true for everybody, whether they receive it or not, the potential is there for them to come into forgiveness and release and peace with God because Jesus' sacrifice was powerful and potent and ultimate. No further sacrifice is required. That's one reason why the Old Covenant era has ended. That's good news. The cross paid for all of it, for everybody, once and for all. Paul says that Satan is defeated. Most Christians struggle to believe that. That's because we believe something that isn't true. We We believe our feelings and experiences. We believe what we've been told And he's succeeding in convincing us that he's more powerful than he really is. Paul said that at the cross, Colossians 2.15, that Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them through the cross. It doesn't say that he destroyed Satan, but it destroyed his ability to function effectively. He removed his weapons. Hebrews 2, 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. At the cross and resurrection, there was a complete spirit realm atmosphere shift. The structures of the heavenly places were forever changed because Jesus removed the authority and the weapons of the evil one. He broke his power, he destroyed his power, and he was seated as regent over all things, over all powers, over all authorities, both the seen and the unseen. Jesus was raised up to the right hand of God and given all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's not up for argument. It's not up for debate. There's no small print in the, or clauses to this. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he broke the power of Satan's rule at the cross. It's done. That's why he said it is finished. And the enemy's been trying to convince us ever since that it isn't.
So the ultimate atmosphere shift, the ultimate authority change, the ultimate cultural turn happened at the resurrection and the ascension when Jesus was installed as king forever. Paul says that uh, he also initiated the beginning of a whole new species on the earth. That when you put when you connect to this reality that has already been established, Paul says that you become a new creation. You become a completely new kind of being that never existed before, which is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. The old life has passed away. The old way of doing religion has passed away. The old way of pleasing God has passed away. The new creation Literally, God's new genesis has happened in you. So there is a new heaven and a new earth to come, but that new genesis, that new creation has already begun on the inside of every believer. You carry, you are already a new person. And you are unique in that you carry heaven and earth in one body at the same time. Jesus was the forerunner. He did that too. This is big stuff. They didn't do that in the old. This is new. So Satan is defeated. Sin is wiped out and dealt with. Punishment is dealt with and we've been made new creatures. It was the end of the temple. Now we're living stones. 1 Peter 2, 5. You yourselves like living stones are being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. That was a big deal for people who'd spent hundreds of years and millions of pounds building a temple with gold and stuff in it because that's what God wanted. The news says you don't need a place. Places are not significant. You're significant because you're the temple. The glory's in you. The glory's in you. The glory's in you. All that stuff you read about and you think, oh, wouldn't it be great that a cloud could show up in, you know, and they sing and they worship and the cloud shows up in the temple. Listen, that can happen in your life every day. You're the temple. You're the place where the glory shows up. You're a glory carrier, a glory encounter, all on your own. And then when we get together, that's what happens in worship is there's more glory because there's more people. And this is also the temple. I'm excited about this. This is good, isn't it? Faith, not ethnicity, gender, or social status are the defining factors of relationship with God. There are no superior gender, no superior ethnicity, and no superior social status in relating to God anymore. There was, but there isn't now. So it used to be the male Jews, they had it the best. And they even prayed and thanked God that they weren't women. And the, the Jews thought everybody else were Gentile dogs. That was their nickname for them. And they even had a thing over a bit of the temple. There was a sort of an outer court where visitors could come. And if you went through, there was like this, this very foreboding thing that said, basically, Gentiles keep out. But Paul, the Jew of Jews, the Pharisee of Pharisees, said this, because he had a revelation as many of you who are baptized, in baptism scripture, into Christ Jesus have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And Ephesians 2, this is something I've uh, referred to before, it says, He himself is our peace who's made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law. of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and make so making peace. There's no advantage of, to any kind of ethnicity or social status or even gender. We're all the same in Christ. We're all being built into this one new thing he is doing in the planet. That's different. It used to be a place. It used to be the Jews. It used to be there was privileges for all sorts of different things. Now you all get the same super privileges. The end of the law means the end of legal principles 
as a way of justification and holy living. In fact, if you think that keeping the rules will help you be a good Christian, you are subject to demonization. Well, that's a bit harsh, preacher. I'm just preaching Paul. What was good and holy in the old is now demonic in the new. Give us a verse. Okay, you wanted a verse, here it comes. Galatians 3 says, verse 1, You foolish Galatian, who has put a demonic spell on you? Is literally what it means. Some translations say bewitched, some say hex. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun with the Spirit, you're now beginning to be perfected by the flesh? Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. If you resort to exercising your faith by keeping the rules, you are under a curse and a demonic influence. It's not a way to improve your Christian life. It's a way to get depressed, discouraged, and demotivated, which is where lots of Christians live, because actually what's in their head is legalism, not freedom and grace. It's righteousness as a free gift. This is outrageous. He just declares you righteous. You haven't done anything good. It doesn't matter. He did the good thing, and he imparts it and imputes it and gives it to you for free. Just look at someone and go, wow, they're so righteous. Look at yourself and think, man, I'm righteous. Can you see? This is, this is huge. Start, you know, devil's defeated. Sin is defeated. Sin is forgiven. There's been a huge authority shift in the heavenlies at the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And then, and then Paul caps it really. With, with, I just want to sort of look at some verses that we've got on a slide. Do you want to stick the thing up there? Paul needed some mighty heavenly encounters to see this. He sees that the old is obsolete. He sees that the old covenant was built on inferior promises. And in Romans 5, this is, this is awesome stuff. This is a, a paraphrase, but it just kind of draws something out. You know, I told you I was going to sort of scripture bomb you today. The conclusion is clear. It took just one offense to condemn mankind. One act of... Whoop. <laughs> one act of righteousness declares the same mankind innocent. Uh, J.B. Phillips says, we see then that as one act of sin exposed the whole race of men to condemnation, so one act of perfect righteousness presents all men freely acquitted in the sight of God. The disobedience of the one man exhibits humanity as sinners. The obedience of another man exhibits humanity as righteous. We are not made sinners by our own disobedience, neither are we made righteous by our own obedience. Radical stuff. The presence of the law made no difference. Instead, it merely highlighted the offense. But where sin increased, grace superseded it. Spiritual death provided sin its platform and power to reign from. That's the old covenant. Sin reigned in the old covenant. Now, grace has taken over sovereignty through righteousness to introduce unthreatened life under the lordship of Jesus Christ over us. The basic argument of this passage is that in Adam all died because Adam sinned, therefore all sinned. So if you're sitting in this room and you're not a Christian, you're a sinner not because of what you did last week, but because of who you're, who you're connected to. Because cause you're born. Just because you exist. But the good news is, so what one act of disobedience spread to all mankind, whether they were aware of it or not? 
He's saying one act of righteousness, which was Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection, spread to all mankind whether they realized it or not. Hello. Now, I'm not saying all people are saved, but I'm saying all people are potentially saved, whether they know it or not. And I am saying the cross and resurrection release the goodness and favor of God to every human being, whether they know it or not, whether they realize it or not. God is in a good mood for them. See, it's really important to know what God's like. Lots of people don't want to come near what they see as Christianity because ultimately the church has represented God as a legalistic, angry, distant, authoritarian figure. And that isn't who he is. We've lived in the old and not in the new. One man opened the door to sin. Sin introduced spiritual death. And both had global impact. It stained the whole human race. I love this. What he's saying is, Grace got out. Goodness got out. Kindness got out. God, God's kindness, God's grace, God's goodness got released to all humanity for free, whether they realize it or not. And all you have to do is connect faith to the offer and you are changed. And you become a dispenser of the new era rather than someone that lives, as it were, in the old. Jesus has released to the nations the good news that God is good. And as we release that good news to the nations more people will go, we want it. Because it's the kindness of God that leads to changing your mind. So just as sin and judgment prevailed through Adam to all men without them acting, favor and blessing is available to all undeservedly and freely. All your friends, all the people in Glasgow, All the people that abuse children and get drunk and kill people. God's released favor to them. Think about it. Not because they deserve it, not because they earn it. He's released favor to them. So you can meet someone who is in who's doing horrible things, you can pray and God will bless them. I'm trying to make it real here. You meet somebody you don't like. That's why we're supposed to, that's supposed to love our enemies, because God does. He's released favor on his enemies. At the cross, he released favor on his enemies. He suffered for all the people who hate him. Come on. He didn't just suffer for the good guys. He suffered for everybody. Yeah, there weren't any good guys. Thinking there were good guys is a lie as well. The shalom of heaven has been released through this ever-increasing kingdom, through the cross and resurrection. Health, well-being, prosperity, kindness. Favor. God's a good guy. He's in a good mood. And he wants the whole planet to know he loves them and wants to do them good. 
and first got to happen in the church. He loves you and wants to do you good. Yeah, but what about all the judgment in the Bible? What about this New Testament? Every time I speak about this, people come up to me, yeah, but what about all those caveat verses? What about Ananias and Sapphira? What about them? They lied to the Holy Spirit and they died. But that's not God in a very good mood, is it? What about the dude in Corinth who slept with his father's the step, his stepmom? And they, they, ju- they had to judge him and put him out of the church. That's, not, that's a bit... What happened to good mood? All of a sudden, God looks like he's in a bad mood. One of my favorite verses I'm going to read to you is in Acts 12. Herod had had James, the brother of John, put to death, and he'd got Peter lined up for it as well, but Peter got let out of jail by an angel. I don't know what James thought of that. (laughs) He gets an angel, I get my head cut off. I don't know the answer to that. On the, then it, and he's really, really puffed up, this guy Herod. So he's killed one of the apostles. And on the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of God and not of man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. <laughs> That's a good Sunday school verse, isn't it? <laughs> Herod got eaten by worms. The way it's phrased, it sounds like the worms killed him. It sounds like he was being eaten alive by worms. That's even more gross. Obviously, an angel had struck it. I'd come and teach that. The kids were, I I just thought that had happened. So God sends an angel to kill the guy, and then he gets eaten by worms and dies. Awesome. We should have a whole preach on that one day. Wow, God was in a bad mood that day. Okay, if you live in Glasgow, would you describe the weather system as sunny Mediterranean climate? Anybody here think that's what it is? Do we get sun in Glasgow? Well, we did. Yeah? But we would, it would never be described as Costa del Glasgow, would it? I've been to Southern California. Now that is mostly sunny. And occasionally it rains. So the climate is different to here. God is love. God is good. God is also judge. But what's the climate of heaven? Is it sunny and occasionally it rains? Or is it just wet all the time and occasionally you get a glimpse of sun? All right, so if you go to heaven, what are you going to encounter in God? You're going to encounter judgment as the tone setting, weather defining environment, yeah? Or you're going to encounter something else. Come on, stay with me. I'm not talking weather, I'm talking heaven, really. What is the climate of heaven? Is it mostly rainy and occasionally you get a good day from God if you're lucky? No, Andy, it's not like that. Come on, Sunday school stuff here. It's not like that in heaven, is it? No, it's not like Glasgow in heaven, in that sense. All right. But we're going to have more of heaven in Glasgow, that's for sure. Let me put it another way. In, we, we've raised, Teresa and I have raised four kids, and, and I believe our basic heart is love and kindness to them, and we are benevolent and loving, and we love our kids, and we like to have fun with them. Occasionally, there were need for discipline. Occasionally, they even drove us to anger and almost distraction. Was that the environment of the house, though? Well, not our house. There are some houses where it is, but not our house.
Yeah? In my house, most it was sunny and occasionally it rained. You start doing that in my house, son, and I need to talk to you about it. I'm not happy, Daddy. Yeah, if you treat mommy like that. Let's, let's see if we can bring some transformation here. <laughs> but if our kids are ever sick, if they're ever in need, it's still the same now, and they, they've grown up. You do anything to fix them. You do anything to redeem them, to rescue them, to, to you just do, I mean, and, and sometimes when they get sick and you can't do anything, it's really painful. We had a son who went through cancer and you're just looking at him there with all these tubes and all this chemo going through and you're praying and praying and praying. And I believe we saw an amazing breakthrough, but while they're not responding and they're just suffering, something in you is being torn up as a parent. You're not wishing cancer on your kids so they'd learn a lesson. No matter how naughty they've been. You know, and every Christmas, you hear it said, we didn't say this in our house because we knew it wasn't true, but if you're good, Father Christmas will bless you with stuff. Well, we just said, no, Christmas is like the gospel. If you're bad, you still get blessed. <laughs> we still bought them presents and gifts and stuff, whether they'd had a good day or a good week, week before, because our disposition was kindly. We were in a good mood most of the time with our kids. Could we, be, could we bring discipline? Yes, we could. But that was not the environment of our house. Hello? See, if you think God's basically in a bad mood, I, for one, don't want to talk to Him. Because all I think I'm going to get is a bit of grief about, you know, you haven't fixed that in your life yet, have you, Andy? If you think he's like that, then you kind of go a bit quiet with heaven because you think, all I'm going to get is a bit of a ticking off. And you know what? The devil loves to join in because he goes, well, not only have you not done it, you're just crap. <laughs> Come on, let's, get, let's be honest about this. And he'll bring out, in your mind, he'll rehearse all the reasons why you are crap. Your whole life is crapness. Jesus died and rose again from the dead to, for you to have an encounter with him so that you would realize that you're beautiful. You realize that you're his poem, you're his artistic work on this planet, not someone who's rubbish. Guess where the other tune's coming from? It's not God. It's not heaven. Hello. God's good. He loves you. He thinks you're beautiful. He thinks you're a creative miracle. He thinks you're a song of heaven, a poem expressing his very heart. See, we relate to a person, not a theological system. If you go, well, there's these verses about judgment and these verses about goodness, let's put them all in the mixer and see what kind of cake you get. Well, let's put them all in the organizational structural plan. We have all these verses. We've got three verses about judgment and ten about goodness. So God is three parts judgment, ten parts goodness. It's not how this works. You'd hate if someone analyzed you like that. There's a thing starting to go around in their leadership team doing strength finders. I haven't done it yet, but three of us have. And everyone who's done it is going, golly, that's not me. So it's like one of these kind of quizzes you do online, and then it tells you your strengths. And it's supposed to encourage you because it tells you your strengths. But the people who are doing it, they're like, that's not my strengths. <laughs> that's not who I am. I'm, I'm having emails. Help. Talk to me. I've just done strengths finders, and I don't understand it. And those of us that know the person who have done it are going, that's exactly you. And they're like, ah! <laughs> that can't be me. Why? We hate being put in a box. Well, I'm three-part judgment, four-part goodness, and five-part creative genius. <laughs> I'm not a system. I'm a person. He's not a system. He's a person. 
And He is fundamentally loving and good. Even in the old, they knew that. Which is why when they dedicated the temple, they sang not, you're quite dodgy and judgmental. We're not really sure if you're going to burn us, fry us, or whatever. But here we are doing our duty to you, Lord. And the fire fell. And the glory fell. Oh, we love the God who is a judge and's angry all the time. Oh, we praise and worship you. You, we don't know where we stand with you most of the time, but we just worship you because if we don't, you're going to kill us. <laughs> and you make us feel rubbish about ourselves. All these rules we never keep. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> Even in the old, they didn't sing those songs. There are songs like that in the Christian hymnology. Oh, Lord, keep us poor. Keep us humble. We're so miserable and small, just like worms before you. There are those sort of words in hymns and songs. I refuse to sing that trash. He didn't make me a worm. He made me a glorious son, a prince in his kingdom. Why would I sing worm when I'm a prince? I don't even want to be a princely worm. I want to be a princely prince. Come on. The devil wants to convince the church that she is sniveling and useless and small and irrelevant and crap. And he bombards your mind with those thoughts all day, every day. He finds Bible verses and twists them to make you believe it. It's a big fat lie. Jesus rose again from the dead to make you significant, powerful, to raise you with him, to rule with him. Come on, let's live in the new covenant era. It's not rules anymore. It's not condemnation anymore. When they dedicated the temple, they sang. He is good, and His love endures forever. And the glory came, and they couldn't minister. See, in heaven it's mostly sunny, and occasionally there's some rain that touches the earth. I'm quite glad that Herod got eaten by worms. (laughs) I think that was the goodness of God to the early church. Because he was after Peter next. He didn't care whether an angel had got him out. He wanted his head. So, you know, kill James, yellow card. So I think you can still see the goodness of God manifest. Even the guy that was judged in 1 Corinthians, the goal was redemptive. And in the second letter, he's saying, come back in, receive the guy. And I said, Sapphira, I think, Praise God that he took them out. I think they still went to heaven, but I think they were introducing lies and deceit into a season of incredible power and purity in the church. I think it's a bit like putting your fingers on live electric terminals. There's such power being released, and you kind of do it wrong. I think you saved them from a worse fate. Hello? You can see the goodness of God even in some of the more difficult passages that we have to deal with. And they are there. uh, But that is not the tone. It's not the environment. It's not the weather system. Hello? He's good. Today, Jesus came to prove it. He went around doing good. Remember? Jesus went around doing good. Jesus is the exact representation of the likeness of God. God somehow managed to represent himself fully and accurately in a human being. And he went around, he just wasn't good in a nebulous kind of ethereal way. He was good and he went around and he did good. Which shows that he was good. He was anointed by the Spirit to do good and heal all who are oppressed by the devil. That's tremendous. 
It's amazing. It's a, it's a revolutionary shift. And it all happened at the cross and the resurrection. God's a healer. God's a provider of actual real money. He wants to do your finances good. He wants to do your soul good. He wants to do your brain good. He wants his shalom to affect every part of your body, your mind, your household, your finances, your business, the people that you meet, your relationships, where you work, where you study. He wants to affect it with his shalom, his goodness, his well-being, and he wants to affect you with it too because that's the nature of the kingdom that is never going to stop increasing on the earth. That's the nature of what he released in his resurrection. He released favor to the whole planet. Just through one man, death came. Through the one man, Jesus, blessing and favor has come.